Hey everyone, welcome to your second Hardware News Recap for this week because there was that much news to report on. First of all, some more unique video cards coming out, but this time from an A-list AMD partner, Sapphire, and we'll be talking about that. Intel and AMD both have some new GPUs coming out, and additionally, Intel's Foundry services actually posting some pretty large increases in revenue, and that is their Foundry as a service, where they manufacture on behalf of other chip designers. It was a major move for Intel a couple years ago, and that's starting to play out now. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lian Li Li's O11D Evo case. The O11D Evo is a mid-tower that tested well previously with us and is most interesting for attention to fine details and its unique features. One of those is the easy-to-use invertible layout. The O11D Evo inversion process is the easiest we've ever worked with on a case, allowing it to flip entirely for a unique upside-down build or work as a standard layout. The O11D Evo has two chambers for the system and the power supply, support for up to nine storage drives, and edge-to-edge -edge glass for a showcase while still offering excellent airflow through side and bottom intakes. Learn more at the link in the description below. Really quick GN store update first. So first of all, the GN15 shirts are in production. Those are the foil shirts that we had up for sale a little while ago. They're getting made. Some of you have reached out asking if there'll be another opportunity to buy those, and unfortunately not, like we said once we sold through them all. That was it. And at this point, they're getting made, but uh, there will be another chance to buy a GN15 item coming up soon. It's a pretty major launch for us. I'm really excited about it. And the design is awesome. It's for, well, I can't say what it's for yet, but it's a GN15 product. So that'll be up in the next month or so if you missed the opportunity on the shirt. That was our 15 year anniversary shirt. We have a couple more 15 year anniversary items to close out this year. As far as the shirt's shipping timeline, we will be shipping it out to customers in September, it's looking like at this point. Uh, in the meantime, we still have code CHAMBER active on store.cameraxis.net if you want to get 10% off any purchases on the store. And uh, that is specifically to help us recoup from investing in our big sound chamber, the Hemi Anechoic Chamber. If you haven't seen it, we talked about it in the last news episode in decent depth, and we have a whole separate video on it that's really cool. Has some interview and discussion style content in there with the builder, and uh, I think a lot of you will like it if you missed that video. So go check that out on the channel or use the code chamber on the store to help support us and get 10% off while you do it. Intel, up as news first. We actually just got back from Intel's fab. We weren't too detailed when we said we were traveling somewhere recently, but that's where it was. We went to Intel's Fab 42, which is in Arizona, and we also went to its neighboring construction sites, and it is an overwhelming amount of stuff going on in construction, especially for Intel in the U.S. right now. Uh, those videos won't be ready for a little while. It's going to be another monumental, like, sort of effort to get it done. It'll be documentary style, just like we did for AMD's labs, except this will be focus on manufacturing and construction of a manufacturing plant, which is really unique and cool. Uh, however, visiting those sites brought us a lot of perspective on just how much Intel is pushing in its fab business. And if you missed the news a couple of years ago, Intel basically made a major shift when CEO Pat Galsiner stepped in, and that shift included moving to manufacturing silicon on behalf of other chip designers, not just first party. So the company has been moving towards selling its fabrication services for a little while now. Given that Intel was originally founded on manufacturing principles, uh, this makes sense. In the newest report for its quarterly earnings, Intel noted an overall reduction in second quarter revenue, down 15% year over year, but it also noted a massive increase specifically in its foundry services. In fact, the foundry service was the only business unit explicitly listed by Intel as being up. And it helps that it's a new unit with low revenue, so the numbers are a little easier for them to play around with compared to the billions elsewhere. But the chart shows client computing as down 12%. That'd be the consumer and gaming parts. Not a big surprise. Everyone bought the stuff they wanted a couple of years ago, and they're good now. And its foundry service is shown as being up 307%. Now, three of these five Intel business units are in the billions quarterly, while IFS, or the foundry service, just hit 232 million. Surely at this point, Intel's investors are looking at that and going like, what is this, like, cover the cost of catering for the company for a year? Uh, but IFS actually does look like it's poised to be potentially a pretty major arm of Intel's business. And there isn't anything to support this yet, but we could see a feasible timeline where NVIDIA might seek out Intel for some of its own manufacturing that it, uh, it currently sources it all through TSMC. It's used Samsung in the past, 
But Intel might not be out of the question if they have the technology in place and uh, specifically the wafer volume. So the main takeaway here to us is that Intel Foundry Services as a business unit may sort of redefine Intel's long-term positioning if it can continue to grow its customer base like this. Of course, today, $232 million to investors certainly is in the uh, category of, what are you, poors? Is this silicon for peasants? Up next, 8-Bit Doe has a new NES-style retro mechanical keyboard that it's launching soon. It comes out in September. But 8-Bit Doe stops just short of using the word Nintendo anywhere on these pages. It also cuts off half of the word Famicom. Instead, the colorway is just Fami. And it removes two letters just for good measure, reducing it down to 33% for just the Nintendo N. It's not the NES. To be very clear to Nintendo's lawyers, they are just launching the N for their model of keyboard, uh, and you can fill in the other two letters. But the colors make it pretty obvious. This isn't officially licensed by Nintendo, clearly, at this point, uh, but it certainly fits the theme. The 8-bit though keyboard unfortunately lacks a numpad. I'd actually switch to it immediately, personally, if it had one. But it'll be shipping in an 87-key layout with kale box, which V2 whites, and die sublimation PBT keycaps. Physical features include knobs for Bluetooth, volume, wireless toggling, a power LED in the theme of Nintendo's old LEDs, and two physically separate ginormous programmable buttons for controller mode or custom programming. The keyboards were around 100 bucks when we saw them listed. They're not out yet. Uh, I might buy one. I, I played a lot of NES and SNES especially, and I do like how the keyboards look. It's just that the numpad's kind of killing me because we do a lot of charts, and charts use numpads, at least if you're trying to be efficient. Next one, Sapphire has its new Party Animals GPUs. These are RX 7600 themed like a game we didn't know existed until we saw these video cards. Ever since we saw the Yeston Q-Pet RX 580 years ago, we had a paradigm shift. We realized video cards can be a lot more unique and not just black and red or if you're particularly edgy, silver and black. Ever since that one, we've reviewed a ton of different styles and designs from various manufacturers, but now Sapphire is announcing its own, and this is a uniquely styled RX 7600 that brings some color to a major board partner. We've seen this style work for much smaller and sometimes no-name board partners in the past. It's very rare that an A-tier partner does it, at least A-tier for AMD here. The new card is shipping to the China market first. Its future in the West is unknown right now. It'll be determined by reception in the Chinese market. We hope to review one of these cards. The card has a painted backplate and a yellow beige with all over print animal iconography. It then continues to the front of the card on the plastics. The card accompanies the launch of the same name game. Again, we didn't know this was uh, a game, but it launches in September. Sapphire says it's shipping a custom skin for buyers of the cards to use in the game. And we've been in contact with Sapphire about this one and should know more soon. The company also showed a small case with party animals theming. Whether or not you'd buy it, like we've said with other uniquely themed cards in the past, as long as it passes sort of base functionality and they're not shortcutting anything that actually is important for the function of the card, then we're always happy to see something creatively different from the usual video cards. And it's nice to see something going from a big name board partner and not just sort of no names that are trying to make their mark. Up next, a new Geekbench listing spotted by video cards featured a Radeon Pro W7600 GPU. The spec listing notes eight gigabytes of VRAM and it remains familiar largely to the RX 7600, but it'll be part of AMD's Radeon Pro lineup. The Radeon Pro lineup sometimes, but not always, features ECC or error checking and correction memory and other features like driver certifications and specialized support for professional users. But otherwise, the cards tend to be uninteresting for the consumer and gaming market because the price runs much higher on them. Uh, and that's all we have on that one. Intel also has two new GPUs. They ship these for laptops, so they're mobile parts. They are specifically the A570M and A530M, and they are DGPUs just for use, again, in laptops. The new A570M is a 16 XE core mobile part running at 1300 megahertz with eight gigabytes of GDDR6. It's accompanied by the new A530M at 12 XE cores on the same clocks, but with configurable memory at four gigabytes or eight gigabytes GDDR6. These parts join Intel's other mobile components, like the more mid-range A770M, 
at 32x e cores and 1650 megahertz. Now, the specs we're seeing for the 500 series of these mobile parts are significantly lower than, say, the A770M. So there's not only a massive reduction in the clocks, but also uh, effectively a halving in the XE core count. So these will not be uh, high performers. As a reminder, the A is the important signifier here. That stands for the architecture. So that'd be Alchemist this time. Next one theoretically would be B. And the 7 versus the 5, you can think of it more like 70 versus 60, an NVIDIA's RTX 40 name. Up next, Colorful has a new RTX 40 series card with a hidden power cable that's on the market. We originally saw Inno3D coming out with these types of designs, but it looks like Colorful hit the market first. This is called the iGame Ultra Z. It's the mega gamer of... I was actually just I was trying to put two gamer words together, and mega gamer is actually a card, and we did review it. Uh, we're going to leave that mistake in the video because it proves the point. It's the Mega XX Destroyer of gaming video cards. So let's see if they come out with one of those. This has a removable section of backplate and a cutout in the fin stack, which allows a single PCIe 8-pin power cable to pass through. Just like with the cards we talked about before, it hides it for mostly aesthetic purposes. The only practical benefit we can think of is maybe easier cable management if you have a case where the side panel would sit really close to the top of the GPU. As for downsides, the clear one is that it adds another step to get to the cable when you want to remove the card, but that's not really that big of a time loss. And it could potentially be bad if the user doesn't plug the cable in all the way, mostly because you wouldn't see anything bad happening until it's too late. This particular design also eschews the non-common flow-through area because of the solid cover, it would almost definitely cool more effectively with the cover removed, but then that kind of defeats the purpose of the cover, which is to hide the cable. And with an 8-pin, it's a much more familiar cable as well. As with a lot of the more unique parts we cover, these are starting out only available from Eastern retailers like JD, uh, appealing to the Asian market. And it's currently priced at $710 for this card it's before shipping, and it's also more expensive than the 4070s from the brands that we see here in the U.S., which seems to just generally be the how the prices get skewed. Thermalrite is launching a new pad instead of paste to go on your CPU, and it's called the... the Halos. I think that's supposed to say Helios. They, they have the sun on the page, which is probably why it should be Helios, but close enough. It's honestly just part of the charm of Thermalrite at this point. They really, they don't care. They don't, they don't care about what the box says. They don't care how accurate the language is. It's kind of like, here's the product. What do you you want something more expensive or what? Because like we we're not gonna pay for spell check here. The Halos is an eight and a half watt per meter Kelvin thermal pad for whatever that's worth. Thermalrite calls this a solid silicone grease sheet, and we really need to get their marketing department to work for some of the fast food chains here, because that would be pretty accurate marketing for for the food. We, would you like a solid? Silicone grease sheet, that's number one. The pads are only 0.2 millimeters thick, which is critical to maintaining any kind of performance whatsoever. If it's too thick, it impedes performance. They come in two versions, and they're cut to fit exactly on either LGA 1700 or AMD AM5 CPUs. Now, the pad's kind of interesting. It's not like the graphite thermal pads or Carbonaut or something like that. Instead, from what we can tell, and we'll try to get some in, it looks like it's effectively a paste. It comes sandwiched between two sheets of protective film or paper, you're supposed to peel those, stick it to the bottom of your CPU cooler, peel the other one off, and then mount that to the CPU itself. So not really the same type of reusability as the IC Diamond graphite thermal pads that people were crazy about several years ago. Um, and more of what you would get here is consistency if you're, say, a business and you're swapping things all the time. A company like AMD might be able to make use of this, but then they still have the downside of having to clean it afterwards unlike, say, a reusable pad as an interface. Something like a system integrator could probably make good use of uh, an application like this because you save a bunch of time on the application, but at $8 for a pack on AliExpress, the pricing runs pretty high compared to a tube of thermal paste. For what we can tell, these seem like just normal silicone tim, but it would be cool if they were actually phase change style, like, say, the stuff that NVIDIA uses on 40 series GPUs. Those are effective because they melt to form an extremely thin layer between the GPU and the cooler cold plate. Honeywell's highest performance PTM 7000 goes up to the same 8.5 watts per meter Kelvin figure, so it's possible that Thermalrite is using something similar but isn't marketing the Helios as, sorry, Halos as such, but we doubt it. So unless this is phase change, 
at least to us, to our audience, it's of pretty limited usefulness or unless the price comes down a lot for uh, business applications, unless they just do B2B pricing separately. So the only real value here for you as an end user would be if you are super anxious about your paste application, but just go a little heavier on it. You really can't go wrong unless it's conductive electrically. Then you can, but don't buy electrically conductive paste if you're not sure what you're doing. Up next, EK. EK has launched two new water cooling kits aimed at users who want to get into custom loops, but either don't want to spend the time picking out compatible parts or don't have the knowledge yet. This type of kit has been offered many times before, but this one is a little different due to coming with higher tier parts out of the box. EK is including the newer Quantum Surface 360 millimeter radiators, high-end quantum velocity DRGB block, DRGB fans, a D5 pump res combo, they really like the letter D, and everything else you need to set up. The price, EK. Like with a dollar sign, that's that's the price. $740 for the kits. You could buy a lot of things for $740, like a video card, multiple high-end liquid coolers, advertisements for money laundering CD key websites. But you wouldn't get the expandability or the peak performance of a custom loop. And as always, getting that last metaphorical 10% costs a lot more. Finally, this is just kind of a fun one that one of our viewers sent to us via email. Uh, MSI, the company that previously tried to effectively, in our opinions, bribe media to take down negative reviews, and once asked us to change the title of a review because it was mean, has its global moderator posting that GN is trash. This actually it doesn't really bother us. It was just kind of funny to read it. But uh, this is relating to a video we posted, I think a couple of years ago, where it was about MSI's setting for combo fix for CPUs, and we titled it Breaking AMD's Rules. That was what you'd call a ton-in-cheek title. There was nothing negative we were saying about breaking AMD's rules and adding features to BIOS. However, MSI's moderator with 14,000 posts here seems to think that this was somehow a slight on MSI and that we were calling MSI out for a feature in its BIOS because the title was pretty literal, which is it was breaking AMD's rules. Just to be clear with everyone, just set this, this straight right now, if we wanted to call MSI out, we would probably focus on the massively unethical practices relating to dealing with independent media and effectively trying to remove that media's independence with money. Just our opinions here. You can see our video MSI kill shot for that. That would be, just, just want to be really clear, if we were going to call a company out like MSI, that would be the thing we'd focus on. The breaking the rules title for MSI Combo Fix, it was actually against uh, AMD's rules at the time, which is why they tried to remove that later. So that's it for this one. Last one was just kind of fun, so we threw it in there. Uh, and that was from one of our viewers. Thank you for sending that over for my entertainment. And you can subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net, patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly, and we'll see you all next time.